So welcome. I'm Delia Clark, and I'm a place-based education consultant working with the Iditarod Historic Trail Alliance in partnership with the Chugach National Forest, BLM Campbell Creek Science Center, and the Anchorage Park Foundation. In normal years, we offer the Iditarod Trail to Every Classroom program, which we call iTrek, as an 11-day in-person teacher professional learning program spread across a year. iTrek encourages teachers to think about how they can connect to place, bring their students outside more, bring outside resources into the classroom, and how they can connect with the Iditarod Trail and the cultural and natural landscapes of Alaska. During the pandemic, we're offering some of the core elements of iTrek as a webinar series to continue to serve Alaskan educators in ways that we hope are valuable to you. We hope that you're able to use the information you get today to encourage your students to get outside and to learn more about the nature and culture of Alaska. We'll be offering the series throughout the school year, and we hope you're able to attend more sessions. If you're interested in receiving either one UAA credit for participating in the series, and or if you'd like a flyer that lists the full series, you can contact us at itrekalaska at gmail.com. So that's I-T-R-E-C Alaska at gmail.com, all lowercase. And now I'd like to introduce today's presenter, Louisa Wolfline. Louisa is the Public Programs and Statewide Support Coordinator for the Bureau of Land Management's Campbell Creek Science Center. Over to you, Louisa. Thanks, Delia. And it's great um, to see folks joining. Um, I would also ask if, if you um, could put where you are located physically, um, that would be helpful because I might not recognize the um, school names. Um, and it's fun to see some folks who are familiar faces and also people who I've chatted with in email. So welcome everybody. And sorry, I'm having, oh, here we go. Sorry, <laughs> just a second, getting my slides to advance. Um, before we begin, I just wanted to go over a couple things about our environment here today. Um, you all are already muted um, when while uh, we're speaking, so that's great. Um, and it's fine to have your video off um, if that's more comfortable. There'll be some points um, during the presentation when I want you to come on um, and share some things. So whatever you're most comfortable with, video and your bandwidth and everything is fine. Um, you can use the chat feature to ask questions or share ideas, reactions with the group. Um, and then if there are, there'll be some times when I will pause to see what questions you have and to, and to respond to things in the chat. And if, um, if there is a point at which you would prefer to ask your question um, all, orally, you can just um, use the raise hand function. Um, which is uh, likely at the bottom of your screen. Um, with, yeah. And then we already know that this webinar is being recorded. So, sorry. Um, I am curious what your experience is with nature journaling. So, if you wouldn't mind in the chat, let me know. Um, let me know that. And, and perhaps you nature journal yourself, perhaps you do it with students. And I would be curious to know, like, what is your experience for yourself and with working with kids, students to do it? Yep, and you can just put that in the chat. I see Sharon, no experience. That's great. <laughs> I don't think you are alone. And all the way to someone, Erin, who's been doing it since she was a kid. Oh, great. Uh, Molly, nice to see that you're doing it with teachers for professional development. 
Yeah. Wow, sawing off pencils to save weight while backpacking and nature journaling. That's dedication. All right, great. Well, um, it's nice to see we have a nice mix of um, folks. Um, sorry. So just to let you know what we're doing this session, um, we're gonna, I'm gonna give an overview about what nature journaling is and why it matters. And then we're gonna spend the bulk of the time actually doing some nature journaling activities that, you know, if you're a nature journal, you may be familiar with them. And if not, um, these are some great foundational nature journaling activities to do with students. And I'll be sharing some tools and tips towards the end. And um, it's my hope that you will leave this session inspired to start, continue, or expand uh, the nature journaling that you do with others. I also want to let you know that after the session, you'll be getting a link to a re-recording of it, and you'll receive a Word document that lists um, some resources, including resources that I'll mention during this webinar. So uh, you don't have to worry about taking a bunch of notes about the things that I referenced because you're going to get a list of resources afterwards. Uh, before I start, I do want to acknowledge that um, there, there are some resources in particular that were helpful for me in preparing this presentation. Um, and they'll be on that list of resources and you'll hear me referring to them. Um, the first is How to Teach Nature Journaling, Curiosity, Wonder, Attention by John Muir Laws and Emily Ligren. And the other is Keeping a Nature Journal, Discover a Whole New Way of Seeing the World Around You by Claire Walker Leslie and Charles Roth. So what is nature journaling? We're gonna spend the next hour um, talking about nature journaling. So it seems like um, a good place to start would be with the definition of nature journaling. So if you could just take a moment and type in the chat um, how you would describe nature journaling. What is it? What session do you think you've come to? Observing what's around you. Hmm? Recording observations that you make. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that's great. So that active. Um, that active participation, being outdoors, observing and recording what you're doing. Um, in their book, Keeping a Nature Journal, Claire Walker Leslie and Charles Roth noted, it's simply put, the regular recording of observations, perceptions and feelings about the natural world around you. And those of you who are answering in the chat were hitting precisely on this point. Uh, John Muir Laws goes on to um, point out that it is also a fundamental thinking tool, a fundamental tool to help you engage more deeply with the world. So throughout human history, uh, people have paid close attention to the natural world around them. I mean, their survival depended on paying that close attention. And a lot of environmental knowledge has been passed from generation to generation orally uh, in cultures around the world since time immemorial. The act of recording nature observations is also something that goes back thousands of years. I don't know if you've heard of the European cuckoo bird, it lays its eggs in other birds' nests and forces them to raise and feed its young. That behavior was described by Aristotle 2,300 years ago. He wrote about it. 
And uh, observers in India recorded that same type of behavior in a different bird, the Indian coel, centuries before that. So this gives you a sense of how long people have been writing these things down. Um, sorry. Uh, there are some famous examples of people who have kept journals and recorded in the recordings of their observations. Um, one is, are the journals of Meriwether Lewis and William Clark. They filled notebooks with notes, drawings, and maps as they journeyed across North America and back. Not sure why we are going, <laughs> sorry. Not sure why it's skipping. Um, maybe more uh, famously here in Alaska uh, was the zoologist and botanist Georg Steller, who was part of Vitus Bering's uh, expedition to Alaska in 1741. He made drawings and wrote detailed descriptions of animals and plants that he encountered. And some of these animals, um, the Steller's sea cow, for example, um, is extinct today. And what we know about this animal is based largely on his recorded observations. Today, all sorts of people keep records of their observations and reflections about the natural world, scientists in all sorts of fields, artists, creative writers, and all sorts of people keep nature journals. Um, these were done by regular people and they also reveal some of the variety that nature journaling can take. Um, on the left, there's an entry that includes, I mean, it's, it's showing the location of small mammal traps in a fish trap and makes notes about the vegetation where they were placed. Um, in the middle, we have recorded um, the experiences in a day and the, the catch of the day, both in writing and picture. And then on the far right, uh, this journaler drew pictures of all of the insects she found on a single tree in her backyard one day. Before we jump into trying some actual nature journaling activities, um, I wanted to just pause and consider why it's important to do it with students. So it deepens observation thinking and memory. Um, when evolutionary biologist Ernst Mayer was asked uh, by a high school biology teacher what he could do to teach his students the most important things they needed to know, Mayer responded, that the most important thing we could do is to teach our young people to observe well. Um, and you may remember the quote I read at the beginning um, from Keeping a Nature Journal. Also in there, they, they note that journaling sharpens your enjoyment of experiences as they happen and creates a memory record that you can return to in the future for reflection and reconnection with satisfying moments of your life. For those of you who, who noted that you are experienced nature journalers, um, I'm not sure if it's true for you. It's definitely true for me that when I go reread passages that I wrote, they take me right back to that place again. I can, I can feel the wind. I can smell what it was like to be there so that it really does deepen that connection to memory. Um, it builds all kinds of skills and the more that you do it with your students, the better and more skilled they will become. It connects people to the place where they are. Uh, when she was 17 years old, Hannah Hinchman, who wrote um, A Trail through, the, through Leaves, um, she used to get up and go, uh, she used to get up super early 
so that she could get to the nature center where she worked early and walk the trails ahead of time. And she wrote, I wanted to hear every note of the pre-dawn bird chorus, wanted to catch the last pocket of night air fragrance, wanted to see what the sun would make of the wash of the dew on everything. So she was obviously building super strong connections to the place. And nature journaling provides space and opportunity for mindfulness to slow down and be present in a particular place at a particular time. At the Campbell Creek Science Center, we, we often give students a chance to sit in a spot by themselves, make observations and record thoughts, feelings, etc. And it is often identified as the most popular activity we do with the kids in a day's programming. So I think <laughs> we all crave um, that opportunity to, to just be still and observe. Um, nature journaling also, um, you build that skill in your students and it gives them something that they can enjoy for the rest of their lives. So, um, we're gonna try uh, some nature journaling activities. And I thought maybe I'd pause and see um, if there are any questions up to this point before we try some nature journaling. I don't see any in the chat and I'm not seeing any raised hands. So I will continue. So, what you need for this activity is a blank piece of paper and something to write with. And it is important, um, especially when working with kids, that you model for them visually what it is that you want them to do. So if we were in person and outside, I would be doing this with a dry erase board um, and a dry erase marker, but uh, we're in this virtual space. so. Um, on my screen, I have my virtual piece of paper. And so if you could orient your paper sideways, divide it into three columns. And at the top of the first column, write I notice. The second column, I wonder. And the third column, it reminds me of. In just a moment, I'm going to show you um, a picture and I'm gonna give you a few minutes um, to look at the picture and record as many observations as you can about it, of what the things that you notice about it. And you can jot them down in bullet form in the first column. You don't have to worry about the other columns on the page right now. I want you to really focus your attention on what you notice. Okay, everybody's ready? Okay, here we go.
Just keep your attention focused on what you notice. If you think you've noticed everything, keep looking. <laughs> Okay, just about 15 more seconds. What else do you notice? Okay, I wonder if um, you know, can't tell if people are still making observations, but um, obviously we are doing this kind of on a quick scale today. I wonder if there's somebody who would like to share, maybe we could take one or two. Um, what are some you know, observations that you made? Somebody willing to share one? You can just unmute. Bright, bright yellow. Bright, bright yellow. Thanks. Was that Molly? That's Aaron. Oh, Aaron. Okay. Thanks, Aaron. Yes. That is some rich color. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm not seeing anybody else willing to brave an observation. <laughs> infinity um, curls the curls they look infinite like the infinity symbol the ah top. that's sharon yeah that the way the um what is that the anthers are curled around like the infinity symbol that's cool keep hold on to that um notion too <laughs> for uh another, another um, exercise coming soon okay so we um are going to look at this again. And this time you're gonna focus your attention um, on the I wonder um, column. So again, I'm gonna give you uh, a couple minutes and um, again, in bullet form, write down what does this, looking at this, what are you wondering about? So you can start. If you're struggling for things to be wondering about, you know, you might think about things like what, and where, and when, and how, and why.
All right, just a few seconds left for I wonder. And I wonder if someone would be willing to share something that they were wondering about. You could either type it in the chat or um, come off mute and share it for everybody. Ooh, I like that. What does the world look like through those huge eyes? Mm -hmm. What kind of insect is that? What breed is it? Was this photo taken in Alaska? I'm sorry. Go ahead, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. This is Molly. I said, I wonder if this photo was taken in Alaska. <laughs> Thanks, it, Sharon, go ahead. Oh, I just wonder um, what it looks like from a different angle. Great, yay. Yeah, oh, I see lots more pop coming into the chat too. Yeah, so there's, it really does pique curiosity, doesn't it? <laughs> All right, well, we're gonna uh, move on to the last column, which on your paper, which is, it reminds me of, and we'll just take probably a minute here, just jot down as many things in that far right column as this reminds you of. All right, so that wasn't a lot of time, but I wonder, uh, would anybody willing to share something it reminded them of? It reminded me of um, being young, a child in my backyard and like squishing dandelions on my face, and getting yellow. <laughs> wow, that sounds like a really happy memory. Well, and I see a somebody's worked in a Apiary, childhood gardens, last summer, mm -hmm. and all the buzzing sounds and warmth. Oh, braiding sweet grass. Mm -hmm. Yes, and yellow and purple blue are so beautiful together. Yeah, that's a, a lovely reference too. Um, well, this activity, thanks everybody for sharing your thoughts and ideas. Um, I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of is an activity um, from the Beatles project out of the Lawrence Hall of Science in California. And it, as you probably could guess, engages the brain in three different ways. It focuses attention through the, um, the observation portion. Uh, it piques curiosity through the I wonder um, section, and then it fuels creative thinking. Um, by getting you, or if you're doing with the students, getting them to make connections between what they are seeing and experiencing in the moment and things that they've experienced in the past. Um, this uh, activity also is a really um, a great structure that anyone, once they know it, you can fall back on it, so to speak. Um, anytime you're out nature journaling and you're not quite sure where to begin um, or what you want to do, I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of, can really help organize um, what you're going to do and kind of focus your attention on what's around you. So, um, yeah, it's a really uh, brain, brain engaging activity on, on, many, on many scales. 
Well, now that your observational skills have been peaked, we are going to try another activity. And this one requires the use of the natural object. And I'm hoping that everybody here uh, was able to bring or has easy access to some sort of natural thing, whether it's a shell, a house plant, uh, a bush outside your house or a tree or something. And if not, hopefully you'll be able to grab something in the moment after I um, give the instructions. So um, as you can tell, this one is called Zoom In, Zoom Out, and it will focus your attention at different scales. So again, I'm gonna just run through um, what I'm going to run through what we're going to do, and then I will set you free for a block of time to actually do it. So I want you um, to, you're going to need a new piece of paper and something to write with again. And I want you to put the date, the time, where you are, something about the weather um, in the corner. Just recording this metadata is a good habit to get into both for yourselves and with your students. And it can kind of break the ice, you know, with writing on that blank page. And um, then what you're gonna do, this is a sketching activity. What I want you to do is on that page, sketch, do a little sketch of your natural object. And in doing that, I want you to uh, record things that you observe about it in bullet form around it and even include things like measurements. All right. Um, once you've done that, I want you to zoom in on one part of it. It might be a leaf, it might be a branch, it might be the edge of the shell, whatever it is. I want you to draw a little circle around it in your original drawing and then do a blowout sketch of what that looks like. And again, I want you to record some things that you notice about it by that zoomed in version. And then lastly, I want you to zoom out. Show that natural object in its environment. So I'm obviously doing a house plant here. And so for me um, in this drawing in its natural environment is like where it is in the room. So it's on a table in front of a window in the corner. And you may have something like that. Um, if you're using something that you brought in from outside, um, you can feel free to imagine the place where you collected it. Um, so for example, if you have a piece of driftwood from the beach, um, you could, the zoom out could be uh, what it was, what it looked like in the place where you picked it up. Um, and if you're doing, you know, a tree outside your window, you could show the street or the yard or the part of the village or whatever it is. Um, okay, we're going to have about, I don't know, five minutes to do this. <laughs> so, um, and oh, and while you're working, I'm going to leave this example up on the screen. Um, this is the sketch I just showed you. And then here's a page from a nature journal that did use this technique. Um, and so these are here just for reference. Um, what questions do you have about what we're going to do? OK, hearing none. I'm going to set you free and um, it's 436. So why don't we be, how about 442, six minutes. And you can, if you want, you can turn off your camera while you're working. And then when you come back, you can turn your camera back on and I'll know that you're back. So see you soon, have fun.
All right. So um, maybe if uh, you could, and I know Molly with virtual background, it might be a little more challenging, but if you could just take your drawing page and if everyone could just hold it up to their camera, we can have a little gallery of drawings. We'd be curious to see what everybody was sketching. So we have a fish and I can't see what everything is. I need glasses, I think. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of dark in here. It's hard to tell, but I have a little piece of driftwood. Uh huh. Yeah, and it is also hard to hold yours up. Oh, yeah. no. Hold yours up and, um, and then also look. Right. <laughs> uh -huh. Oh, and I, I see, uh, Sharon, you had a, a sweet potato. That's, um, that, uh, that's often a good thing um, to grab is something, you know, to go like foraging in your refrigerator or <laughs> something for things to draw. There's often interesting things. Um, oh, great. Molly, you brought your plant right there so we could see what you were working on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Um, so I'm curious, and you could put these in the chat um, or raise your hand and come off mute. Um, curious your thoughts you have for how you might use this. You know, would, is this something you would want to use with students? How might you adapt it? Looks like there might be some typing going on. And if, if you've done it, I'd be curious, even just with a show of hands on the screen, like who's done this with folks, you know, with students or adults before. Okay, well, I think my, my, um, my chat is a bit delayed. So I think I will uh, move us on. So the last thing that we um, are going to focus on is um, what's called free writing. And so, um, you know, we've, we've kind of written observations and then we've done some sketching and um, incorporated art with making the observations. And so now we're just gonna take time to just write. And um, if, again, you need another piece of paper um, and that same old writing implement. And uh, again, for just good habit, you know, record the date and the time where you are, something about the weather uh, at the top of your page. And I'm gonna give you two prompts and you can pick one of the prompts and then, um, and you will write about that for five minutes, okay? And I'm gonna leave these prompts up on the screen the full time and I'm also just gonna um, read them now. So the first prompt is describe, and when you would, for this one, you want to like look out the window or if it's warm and comfortable enough to actually go outside. Um, but you wanna describe everything you observe that affirms the season we are in. What do you see, hear, smell, and feel? Or the second option is to picture a natural place you enjoy. Imagine you are exploring it and you are only four inches, oops, four inches tall. <laughs> Describe what it's like to be there. Then imagine you're 12 feet tall. What is it like to be there? So it is 4.48. So we're gonna be back at 4, 
well, let's say 454, since I'm not sure how far into this 48 we are. Uh, so remember, you're just picking one of them and you're just going to respond to it and just, just write and write for five minutes. And again, um, you can turn off your camera and then when you come back, please turn it back on. I'll know you're back and I'll see you here uh, in five minutes. Enjoy. Great. Um, so hopefully everybody is back or hearing my voice, you are coming back. Um, and it looks like uh, somebody went to the beach with option two, um, which is kind of fun. And yeah, it'll look like most people chose option one. Um, for those who chose option one, um, I, I don't know if you don't have to share what you wrote, but I'm curious, like what, um, like where your writing took you, what, what you found yourself thinking about, um, what the signs were that you found yourself honing in on. Anybody willing to share? Somebody who did summer share. I need some summer. So you want me to share what I wrote down? Is that what you said? You, if you want to share something that you wrote, that's fine. Or if you just want to describe where it is that your writing took you, like the things you found yourself thinking about, oh. writing about. Um, well, I definitely was not thinking about summer. Um, we are in the middle of a snow, uh, snowmageddon Snowmageddon get in right now in Juneau, Alaska. Um, we're on uh, schools clo been closed the last couple of days. It's so bad, um, and uh, has turned to ice and uh, rain and everywhere. So I'm hearing water dripping, and I'm thinking about um, which is why I'm kind of distracted because <laughs> the news is coming in as we speak. Um, distracted thinking about people and. Um, if they're safe and um, you know homes that are getting flooded right now and a couple of buildings roofs collapsed today under snow. Um, it's cold and it's wet and it smells delicious and uh, it's um, it smells like snow and earth and it's just all I hear is just water dripping everywhere because it got really cold and now it's and it, it dumped and now it's melting. <laughs> wow. I, I wasn't aware that you were facing all of that, so much snow and then the weather changes. And thanks for sharing that, Sharon. And I hope that you and others remain safe down there. Thank you. Yeah, we just yeah. got news that school is closed again tomorrow. So we've had on our third wow. snow day this week to keep us wow. safe. Yep, yep. Then the, you sound like the valley has been last week. Yep. Yeah. A lot of weird weather going on. Well, thanks for sharing. <laughs> um, these are two different um, kinds of writing. Um, you know, one observational free writing about where you are, when you are, and one that's very imaginative. Uh, there are other things that you can do with writing. Um, and uh, I wanted to bring your attention to this. Drew Lanham is an African-American professor of wildlife ecology and a birder and a naturalist and a hunter conservationist. And um, he made his nature-based reflections public through his blog, Wild and in Color. And I think, um, you know, it can be interesting depending on the grade level of the students you're working with, you know, just the idea of using the, the writing exercises that you do with your students to have them maybe create a blog. And you know, the idea of a blog post um, is just another avenue. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and you could also think about like other forums for the nature writing that your students do to appear. 
like part of your school paper or um, maybe you have a place in the library or you could you know you have a school literary magazine or um, there's um, you know a bulletin board at the native village office or a community center or you know the grocery store whatever like there just could be interesting outlets for the the posts that your students do the things that they write um there's reflective writing there's pre creative stories there's poetry um and so anyway i just wanted to touch on um just to be thinking about the ways in which not only the writing assignments themselves could vary but the ways in which they might be used I wanted to take um, just a couple minutes to talk about um, helpful tools for doing nature journaling successful with students. Um, and uh, first, it's important to have something that is the nature journal. And this can be, a, you know, you can just put paper together and bind it with rubber band and pencil. Um, uh, what, and then I have some different things here. A, sketchbooks, um, composition books that are filled with graph paper rather than lined paper. Um, and then underneath those here, um, the bare, there are things bare books where you can get, you can actually, you know, you can buy blank books that students can decorate the covers of um, as well as fill the pages inside with their observations. Um, what you want, it, whatever you're using, you want it to be sturdy enough that the students can hold it in their hands and write and have a back support. So like a sketchbook has a hard back cover, the composition books provide good support, the bare books have a hard cover. Um, and if you're using um, something like paper to have um, paper that you've bound or stapled together um, to have some sort of clipboard or cardboard writing surface, just something that they can use as a backboard for it to provide that support. Um, writing utensils, I prefer um, pencil, um, and then of course a good eraser, um, but you can also have the students using um, pen, but that's fine too. Um, a ruler is a good thing to have because you want to encourage your students to take measurements of the things that they see. That that's doing that activity of measuring and recording numbers and things is an integral part of a well-rounded nature journaling program. Um, it, you might start to feel like there's a lot of stuff the kids are carrying. And so one thing that you can do is have them copy a ruler onto the back inside cover of the thing that they're using for their journal. So now they have a scale to take with them. Everywhere they go that they have their nature journal, they'll have it. And it won't be something that they have to, um, that they could lose in the field or whatever. Um, colored pencils, I think, are fun. Um, if, but you don't have to take them in the field. You could use them when you come back inside. But it can be something to add some color to the work. Um, and you need, each person is going to need a way to carry everything. And that can be as simple as a Ziploc bag. Um, Having a pad to sit on can really increase the comfort of people outdoors. And um, in the winter up here, um, it can be especially important so that they can sit in place and be comfortable while outdoors in the winter time. Uh, kids do need to be comfortable. Um, if they aren't comfortable, they're not going to be able to concentrate. Um, so you know, you want them to dress appropriately for the weather, um, as well as have like that pad to sit on to be um, comfy. Uh, you want to set clear expectations for being outside. Um, your students need to view the trips you take outside to Nature Journal as an extension of your indoor classroom. Um, you know, outside, outside time isn't recess. Um, they have work to do when they're out there. And so the same rules that apply in your classroom for behavior, um, plus a few specific to being outdoors, um, you should set those up. There should be clear boundaries for the space in which the kids um, or adults, whoever you're working with, 
um, are uh, completing the tasks that you assign them. Um, and it can be really impactful um, if they have a special spot that they can revisit um, over and over um, through time. Um, and, you know, you will, I'm, you know, know what the boundaries are to set spatially, you know, whether it's staying on the school grounds or in a particular area of the school grounds, or if you're taking them to a beach, you know, and they're not going to go past this log or they're in the woods and they need to stay in whatever that boundary area. I mentioned before um, how important it is for you to show them what you want them to do. Um, and uh, yeah, and to do that visually so that they can really get a picture in their minds of the task to complete, that's um, important. And you want everybody um, to keep safety in mind, um, to be respectful of the plants and animals around them. Um, while they're working, you wanna circulate around and be sure that they are keeping on task, answer questions, um, et cetera even while you are also nature journaling with them. It's important for them to see you also doing this task and it can create a, um, a journey of learning together um, and sharing afterwards that can be really, um, really valuable and fun. <laughs> um, there are lots of prompts to use for writing, lots of resources to use for nature journaling exercises, um, endless activities to do to focus attention. At the Science Center, we have um, a collection of simple outdoor activities that anyone can do, and many of them could easily be used as the basis for nature journaling activities. There's even one specifically on nature journaling that contains 18 different nature journaling prompts. So, um, the website is here, uh, and I encourage you to use those resources. They are there um, and available for free. Um, there's one on mindfulness and one on winter wonderland that um, can, you know, may be especially uh, helpful in focusing student attention outside. And one last pause to see um, what questions. Um, you have before I wrap up. Um, this is not a question, but a comment. And I appreciate the um, comment you made earlier about the nature journaling activity being so popular when you've done that with your people that visit the Science Center and that they crave that mindfulness. And um, I just want to reiterate that because I've had a lot of experience taking kids in particular, fifth graders into the woods to teach lessons. And um, whether we do a silent walk or a silent observation or actually have that time and um, space to do the nature journaling, it, I absolutely 100% agree with that comment. I hear it too. And I, even fifth graders will ask to be quiet again. Can we do that again? you know, just walking quietly through the woods or sitting in the woods quietly. They want to do it again and they don't know they can anytime. Just go be quiet, but they, they love that. So just wanted to reiterate that. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that, Molly. Um, yeah, it really, it's amazing how, um, how much it means to, to kids, to adults, to have the time to sit and be quiet or walk and be quiet, just to be quiet outdoors and pay attention to what's going on. Yeah. And sometimes um, I find for the winter, taking a, a quiet walk through the woods and then coming inside in nature journaling is a little easier just because mm -hmm. of the cold and it is hard to sit still and write when it's cold out, even for adults. Yes, very true. I actually do that myself as well, <laughs> indeed. Um, so let's see. Yes, it is a great gray owl. Um, and, uh, advice for dealing with kiddos who rush through exercises. Um, I'm, I don't, 
I don't know if there are other answers in this group um, of things to do. Um, but, uh, you know, like it's easy. I think kids who are rushing through maybe are the kids who you're checking in on while you're outdoors and they're um, uh, trying to skip ahead or losing focus. Um, I don't, I don't know. I haven't had this problem really. It seems more a problem of getting them to stop when it's time to be done. <laughs> um, I'm just thinking, uh, you know, asking, asking them to um, sort of being at their elbow and helping them focus their attention, you know, ask them, kind of guide them through a few times or a time or two, maybe enough to get them in the rhythm of what you're trying to do. Like if you're trying to focus their attention to notice, you know, to prompt them with questions, like in that moment, um, well, what what's that connected to? Or what do you see above it? And how long is it? And just asking those, the questions that they, you're hoping they're developing to ask themselves can be helpful. And I'm seeing there's a couple, there are a couple ideas in the chat as well. Um, so giving them a number of things to look for, you know, a finite, so that that forces them to find those, those three or four or whatever things. Pausing attention and then looking again. Yeah, these are some great ideas here in the chat. Uh, before closing, I wanted to acknowledge um, again the um, the resources I found particularly useful and the sources of the pictures. Um, and I'm hoping, as I said in the beginning, I hope this session has maybe given you a calm end to your day and proven um, inspirational for starting or continuing expanding your use of nature journaling. Um, and I wanted to close out um, with a quote. Uh, and this is from the How to Teach Nature Journaling book by John Muir Laws and Emily Ligren. Nature journaling is about learning to pay attention, to wonder, to think. It is about guiding the young people in your life to meet the world with curiosity and awe. It is about finding joy and surprise in the daily delights of learning. The world rich with beauty, wonder, and mystery is waiting. Grab your journals and go outside. And with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Delia. Well, Louisa, I feel so much calmer than I did an hour ago. That was yeah. wonderful. You know, I think, I know that this program is about how to work with children, but I think sometimes we need to give ourselves the gift of taking time to breathe and reflect and settle in as well. So thank you for this wonderful program. Um, excellent as always. Um, I wanted to point out a few more things that are coming up. Um, on January 27th, we'll have an introduction to the uh, Iditarod National Historic Trail, which has historically been historically been one of our most popular programs. It's just excellent. It's uh, packed full of information and and really fun. On February 1st, we have um, Marshall Welsh joining us from California to talk about reflection and the power of reflection in place-based learning, how you can help students to reflect on their own work, how you can even uh, assess their reflect their reflections in an appropriate way. It's a it's um really fascinating session. On uh, February 17th, I'll be back with um, questing two. So taking questing to the next level, we'll be working on uh, how to do research, more on map making and writing clues and that kind of stuff. On March 1st, um, Olivia Frankie is going to share with us her I did our National Historic Trail Educator's Guide um, that she developed last year and uh, everybody can get a copy online and learn all about that. So uh, there's a, a lot going on and then there are a bunch more that go on throughout March and April. Um, if you'd like a flyer that lists them all, you can contact us at um, 
uh, itrekalaska at gmail.com. So I-T-R-E-C Alaska at gmail.com. Um, and if you're interested in getting one UAA credit for this uh, series, there you can still register. I think registration closes, I'm going to go with early 20s of January, pretty soon anyway. So if you're interested in that information, um, you can find out more about it at www.idirod100.org slash itrek-education-program. You can see the address there on the sheet. Or if you email us, we can send you that information. Um, basically, the requirements are to attend, I'm going to go with 10 or 11 sessions. I can't have it right top of mind. Um, or look at them in videos and then join a couple conversations with the other people in the cohort and write um, a one to two page a reflection on how you've used some of this in your classroom. It's meant to be 30 hours of application, but you're already teaching, so uh, so that counts. So um, we'd love to have you join us in the UAA credit cohort. And thanks to all of our sponsors, Anchorage Park Foundation, the U.S. Forest Service, BLM Campbell Creek Science Center, and the Iditarod Historic Trail Alliance. It's been super fun being with you tonight. Thanks so much, and thank you again, Louisa. Yeah, thanks everybody. Great to have you.